Father, I just want to thank you for your presence here. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing. I pray that the words that I speak today will come from you. I thank you that they'll be full of life. And I want to thank you that they'll penetrate hearts and bring about change and transformation. I want to thank you for new life that is sown in people's hearts today. And I want to thank you, Father, that it grows and it matures into the fullness of what you've designed it to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, there's something you need to know. God is reaching out to you. If you haven't got that yet, you need to know God is reaching out to you. From the very beginning of time, God was looking for relationship with man. That's really what he wanted. And so if you have a look at God's interactions with things, God is always looking for an opportunity to reach out and touch your life. What he's looking, you have to be with me today, okay? So the way that I know that we're on the journey is just wave your hand every now and again, or even if just poke the person next to you and just say amen. Even if you don't, it's at the wrong time. It doesn't matter. It just means two things. It means you're awake and it means that you kind of, you're on the journey, even if we're not there yet. What is I talking about? Okay, he's reaching out to you. God is reaching out to you. God wants to touch your life. But the thing about it is, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like creation, the famous painting, creation. God is reaching out, but he's waiting for you to reach out as well. So it's a two-way street. So God is always reaching out to you. And the thing about it is, remember, we're in a very different covenant because we're in a new covenant. And what that means is the new covenant is completely to do with Christ. It's completely wrapped in Christ. Everything that, uh, that the new covenant is about is about Christ. So anytime you hear a sermon, every, hear, every time you hear a teaching, anytime you read a Bible verse, if it doesn't lead you back to Christ, you haven't got the full journey yet. Everything finds its origin and its authorship in him. Christ is everything about the new, ta- the new covenant. And so when, when God wanted to reach out to man because he had been absent For so long, what he did was the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the thing is, what God wanted us to recognize was this. Life with God is completely different to life without God. You may be in the world, but you're not of the world. What he was trying to demonstrate to us is this. I've come to introduce you to the opportunity to be able to touch and experience the divine life. The divine life, the word made flesh, was in the world, but was not of the world. Okay, stick with me here. <laughs> Remember, jab that person. Say, say, say amen. amen. And in the world, but he's not of the world. What it means is this. He's not limited by everything that goes on in the natural. He's equipped you to be able to live in the natural, so he's given you a head. And so we understand our world and we understand what's going on there. But what he wants to do is he wants us to get to a place where we recognize the fact that when we start to deal with the things of God, don't let your head get in the way because your head is a conformist. Your head wants to have a look at your situations and its understanding and the the, the facts and, and everything that goes with your world. And it tries to take the world of conformity and introduce it to God's world of possibilities and the problem with it is anytime we do that we compromise what God wants to do because we can't see how it's going to happen and he said I didn't ask you to come and figure out how it's going to work I just want you to trust me that's why God catches your heart and not your head in your heart I can believe some stuff I can trust some stuff I can have confidence in some stuff even if I can't reason it that's why he touches your heart all things are possible to him that believes It's about your heart. That's where God wants to touch you. So the thing is that God is always reaching out to us. And when God became flesh and dwelt among us, what he was saying was, if you want to touch the world of the divine, if you want to experience God in your life, you got to come to me. So you may be a person with an issue of blood, but I'll tell you what, if you could just touch the hem of his garment, something will happen. You may find yourself in a storm today and there may be, may be all kinds of stuff happening around you. But if you will open your eyes and you see Jesus walking on the water, the storm will be still. And you may even get to walk on the water. The thing about Christ is this. You may be in a place where you're sitting in church and you went to go and hear him speak. But you know what? You got hungry at lunchtime. It's like when it hits 12 o'clock, everybody starts going... Why? Because I'm hungry, but it's okay. I'll tell you what, if you have a few loads of bread and a couple of fish, you could fair feed 5,000 if you went to him. 
What God wants you to know is this. The world of possibilities that exists with God is beyond the scope and the limitations of our natural realm. And he wants you to have access to that. He wants you to participate in it. And all of that comes as a result of relationship with who he is. When you get born again, what happens is the word that that became flesh and dwelt among us becomes the word that comes and lives on the inside of who you are. But God's focus still hasn't changed. He still wants to become flesh and dwell amongst people, which means he's wanting to take over your life. And so he invites us into something called being conformed to the image of Christ. What he's saying is this, everything that defined who you are has been something that has come about as a result of your exposure to the world and your environment and your history and your parents and your, in, your, your, your involvement with all kinds of ideas and thoughts and everything that's been put into your life. And what he's saying is none of that stuff is really consequential about your future. If you can just come to me and discover who I am and you can discover yourself in that context, you will not only step into the truth of who you are in your identity, but you'll live from a different place. What I want to speak to you about today is this. Your future is calling you and you carry within you both your destiny and your purpose. People think that their destiny and their purpose is outside of themselves. And so what I want to show you today is that destiny and purpose are inextricably linked to God and that you carry them inside of yourself. And if you can pull them outside of where you are and you can step into them, you will realize them in your life. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Anytime it speaks about glory, it's speaking about the God life. What it's saying is your opportunity to participate in the God life is completely dependent on your ability to link up with and live from Christ in me. I didn't even get one amen. I thought that was a, that's a good point for Jesus apart from me. Okay. Let's have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. It says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Not all men are the same. Not all men are the same. The moment that you met Christ and you accepted him as your savior, you became a brand new creation. Something happened to you which separates you from other men. You have the life of God on the inside of you. With the life of God existing on the inside of me, there are some things that are so important. I cannot get away from the fact that Christ is the author of everything. And so the funny thing about it is, it's really hard coming up with a new sermon with regularity because it all goes back to Christ. (laughs) And it's all expressions of very similar things because that's where you find it. And so you can step outside of that and you can come up with something which is motivational, but if it's not an expression of who he is, it lacks authenticity and truth. So it's all wrapped up in who he is. So I made a statement that we carry our destiny and we carry our purpose inside of us. So let me talk about that a little bit and so I can explain what it is that I meant. When we talk about our destiny, we're talking about ultimately who were you defined to be? Who are you becoming? What is the authentic you? In a spiritual context, destiny has everything to do with identity. It has to do with becoming. We spoke about this a a couple of weeks ago, but the more you get to understand God, the more you will become like him. The reason for that is this. Understanding in a spiritual context, whenever you hear the word understanding in a spiritual context, it doesn't have to do with information. It has to do with transformation. And so let me give you an example of what I mean. When we talk about understanding in a spiritual context, it's about what are you becoming? If we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, peace, okay? I can give you a full description about what peace is, and you can understand it, but you really have never experienced it. 
The only time you get to really know what peace is, is when it becomes a part of who you are and you step into that paradigm and you live from peace. When I live from peace and I experience peace, I really have a, a comprehension as to what peace is about. I can talk to you with authority then about what peace is because it's been a part of my being. Up until that point, I really don't know about peace. I've got some hypothetical ideas about peace. I've got some theories about peace, but I don't know for certainty what it is because it's never been a part of me. So everything that has to do with understanding God is an invitation to becoming something. Anytime God invites you to understand who I am and what I'm about, what he's saying to you is, I'm looking for you to, to engage destiny. I'm looking for you to recognize the fact that you are becoming the true authentic you. You went and ruined yourself. I know you can't believe that, but it's true. But I've got good news for you. Because in this day and age, nobody ever wants to accept responsibility for anything. Remember, it's not me. But this really isn't your fault. This was Adam's fault. He went and did it. And the reason that he did it was this. When Adam was created, he had had a soul in perfect order. He had a brain to engage his world and God birthed his spirit on the inside of him, so he had a mind. But it was in perfect order. The two became one as a living entity. You cannot separate your actions from who you are. They're all intermingled and they live together. You cannot say, I'm a righteous person and live sinfully. Something's going to be at odds. Why? Because I am a complete unit. I am a living soul. So in that space, what God did was he had a divine order. The divine order was his spirit on the inside of me, which informed my spirit and my mind, governed my brain and my body. And so everything worked really well. It was perfect. Adam understood who he was because he was defined by God. But when God left as a result of him sinning, Adam was like, where am I? I'm naked. What did he mean? The source of my identity is left. Now all of a sudden, Adam had to go out and try and discover who he was. All of us have spent our whole lives trying to discover who we were. And we've been exposed to so much stuff. We've thought so many things. We've been involved in different situations, which have peppered our lives with some things that are good and some things that are bad. And so we've come up with an idea as to who we are. But any time we come up with a self-definition that never included God's perspective, it's wrong. So the thing is, I'm at a place right now, the good, the bad, and the ugly is who I am. And so Christ says, you know what? I'm so wonderful. I'm so happy. Let me come into your life because I'll tell you what it is that I want to do. I'm not only going to give you eternal life, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an opportunity for you to partake of that life. And so everything that you've defined defined your life by that is incongruent with my definition of who you are, we're going to take it and we're going to throw the head out of your heart and we're going to introduce you to truth. So you're going to begin to step into the true me. I'm beginning to change. I'm beginning to become something new. I'm being conformed to the image of Christ. I'm on the road of destiny. I'm going somewhere because I'm not the person that I used to be. You should be changing. I said this a few weeks ago and I'm telling you it's true. If you're not changing, you're out of the will of God. The reason I tell you that is this. Why? Because God's will is that you be conformed to the image of Christ. What it means is I should be making regular discoveries. What? Look at this. This is compromising my life. Get rid of it because I'm building God on the inside of me. I don't need that inside of who I am. I need more of him. I should be changing into his image. It's not just about you. You'll reach a point where you start to discover that the reason that he's changing you is for the world. Why? Because the, world, because the word is to become flesh in you and dwell among them. There is a goal and there is an objective that is so much bigger. So when we talk about understanding God, we're talking about becoming more God-like. Becoming, becoming. I I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago and I, I wanted to resonate with you. The measure of your Christianity is what have you become? Are you becoming? If all I ever do is listen to things, even though it's truth, and I'm able to assimilate them, and I'm able to store them in my head, but it doesn't change who I am. It never fulfilled its purpose. It never fulfilled its purpose. 
The whole reason that, that we're exposed to him and his life and the truth that he offers us is so that I become something new. I'm walking into my destiny. I'm becoming something. I'm going to talk about becoming in a minute and why becoming is so important. I'm becoming something. Becoming your destiny is inextricably linked to your purpose. In the spirit realm, what you have and who you are, who you are, is what you live by. What you live by is what you have to invest in your world. If you don't, if it doesn't define your being, you can't inject that into your world. I'll show it to you in a minute. Just trust me. Just believe me for right now. Put that on the back burner because we're coming back to it. The point is that, that God... Is so interested you. Sorry, I'm just, I want to jump a little bit here. Let me speak to you about this. I know I'm, I'm one of those broken records. I'm always hopping on about some stuff, but I want to tell you something. Because if you, anyway. So what I want to tell you is this. The reason God gave you your head, please use your head. <laughs> I can't tell you. It'll get you out of so many. You don't need God in some situations. Some things are just pretty, it's, it's easy to understand. Okay. But it just don't let it be the source of your life. Okay. But use your head. Expand it. It's a good thing. But the point is this. Your head was never designed as a resting place for God. I'll tell you why. Because in your head, the thing is this. What God wants to put into your life is he wants to make you a new creation. What you know, what's up here, the information that you have will never make you a new creation. The creation stays the same. It just builds up a larger knowledge base. But I haven't become anything new. Ultimately, really what it does is it says, I didn't really need Jesus to come and make that sacrifice for me. Why? Why? Because I can get all the knowledge. What, what did I get from, apart from it being an historic fact? What did I get from the fact that he died for me? I just know it. But I never became anything. The reason he came to die was not so that we could be, he could become somebody recorded in history and we could speak about everything that he did and who he was. The reason that he came and he died was so that you could get born again, so that you could have the life of God put on the inside of you, so that you could live from that and experience it, so that you could walk into the fullness of what that was all about. You are to be born of him. Unless you're being born, you're living in the natural that's why everything that God does, because it's spiritual, is about birth. That's why keep your head out of your heart. Use your head, but understand that there is a place when God made you a living soul. Spirit inside of body. Mind together with brain. Complete unit operating cohesively as a single unit. The point is this. Use both of them. The one is to engage and understand my natural realm and give me some inputs as to what's happening in my environment. It lets me enjoy my world because I have sensations that come from that. But it's not there to dominate me. I'm to live by his life on the inside of me, which, which supersedes everything that I get from my head. Don't let your head into your heart because it'll start to compromise what God wants to do. Every time what God wants to do something in your life, I promise you it's beyond the scope of what you can do. Yeah. And the thing with it is, that's just what God is because he's a big God. God doesn't think like us. The thing with it is we natural. So we always default to our head and we go, but I've got this and I've got that. And then I don't have the money for this and that's not going to happen. And these people are not there. there, there. And I've got all the reasons why it can't happen. And God says, yeah, no, but let's, let's have a look at what we can do. And what do we say to God? But, but God, you don't understand. I'm a double-minded man. God's wanting to introduce me to possibilities. He's wanting to introduce me as to what it is to live from the divine on the inside, which means stop being limited by your natural. Let him do some stuff in your life. But every time he wants to do something and I go to him with a butt, I'm in trouble. I'm taking my head and I'm putting it in my heart. Get your head out of your heart. Get your head out of your heart. Become.
coming is so important. And I was thinking about this, and I want to talk a little bit about it because I want to flesh it out a bit and give it some definition so that, you know, it's just perhaps a little bit easier to understand. Um, but it's practical. It's me having changed and introduced a new dimension to my life that I never had there before. But it's all about being born of it, being born of it. Let me give you an example. The nice thing about um, being on earth is you can do different stuff. And sometimes you can just do some fun things. Go and take an art class. Go and take an art class. I'm going, this is my example. I'm going somewhere. <laughs> Don't zone out now. This is not the commercial break. Go and do an art class. And you may be like, you know what, that sounds like a great idea. I've never done anything like that in my life. So what do we do? We go to the art class and we sit down there and they say, here's your paper, here's your pencil. So now I want everybody to draw something. So we all draw our little drawing. We, I want you to draw a, a, a portrait of the teacher up front. And so everybody's drawing their idea of the portrait. And then she says, now what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to give you some paints. And I'd like for you to paint that. And so everybody uses the medium and they start painting. And they come up with an idea as to what it looks like. And she says, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a little bit of help now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some theory. So I'm going to speak to you about how you actually get dimension. I want to speak to you about balance. I want to speak to you about the importance of putting in, into a picture something called a focal point. I need for you to understand how it is that you use the nuances of different mediums and how you're able to manipulate them in ways so that you can extract the best benefit out of it. She's so giving you all the theory about what it is to be a, a person who can make an outstanding work of art. But the truth of it is this. No matter how hard you try, no matter how much experience you have, no matter how much theory you gained, the thing is, you're either an artist or you're not. And if you're not an artist, your work of art is never going to end up in the Louvre. <laughs> you can put it down there and you can understand everything. But you know what? The heart of an artist is creativity being born on the inside of where you are. If you don't have a creative heart, you will never create a masterpiece. Because what inspires the masterpiece is the imagination that lives on the inside. It's something that is alive on the inside of who the artist is. It's a living thing that's on the inside. And it inspires every part of who they are. And when they live from that, what ends up happening is it's something that's been birthed in them. I can't give it to you. You can't manufacture it and you can't fake it because when you put that picture down there, everybody gets to look at it and say, what else you got? <laughs> Why? Because you're not an artist. The thing about it is when you're an artist, you live from a creative foundation. It's who you are. I don't have to try to get the theory every time I'm trying to do a painting. All of what that is about is part of who I am. And so when I sit down with a canvas, it just comes naturally to me. It just flows out. Why? Because I'm a creative being. Why? I live from who I am. When I live from who I am, it's not limited to one aspect or every avenue of my life. If you're a creative person, it bursts into everything that you do. You wake up in the morning and it's like, i got to get dressed. You never get boring. You always make an effort. Why? Because imagination is at play. Imagination is introducing, what about a new idea? How could I be creative in this? What is that expression going to look like? Because I'm a creative person. I live from it. I walk into life and I walk into every day and it's like, what are we going to do for dinner? Well, let's get creative. Why? Because the thing is, you've 
but it's born on the inside of you. You cannot get stuck to a recipe because imagination keeps kicking in and going, I wonder what would happen if you just tried this. What if you just like added that to it? What would happen? I'm doing what, why? Because who I am is expressing itself in everything that I do. You get out into the garden and you can see things and it's like, no, I think that that should be a bed over there. And let's pull this out over there and add some grass over there. Don't drive on my grass. Add some grass over there. There. Whatever. Why? Because I'm living from who I am. Who I am is not contained to one dimension. It affects every part of who I am. And when I live off that foundation, it infuses and, and permeates every part of my being. I became something because I was born that way. It's nothing that lives in my head. It's a foundation that defines the essence of who I am. And when I live from that, it expresses itself in me. You are called to becoming. You are called to allowing the nature of God and who he is to be expressed in who you are. And as each aspect is put into you, is birthed on the inside of you, it begins to grow up and it has a life of its own and begins to express itself in you and through you. And you can't help it. Why? Because it's who I am. Jesus goes down to get baptized. By John and he gets baptized and he comes up out and what ends up happening is his voice and it's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and the Holy Spirit fell on him from the moment that Jesus was conceived he was God the son he grew up as God the son and he grew and matured in God the Son. But when he was baptized and the Holy Spirit fell on him, he stepped into Christ, the anointed one. This is who I am. The first thing that happened after he was baptized was he went out to be tempted into the wilderness. But what happened after that? He went back to Nazareth. He went back to where he was born. And he walked into the synagogue and he said, Give me the scrolls. And he picked up the scrolls. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, this is what he said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Whoa! Lord! <laughs> because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What did he do? He went in there and he said, I've got news for you. I grew up here as Jesus, the child, but I introduced myself to you as Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one. I've stepped into something. This is who I I am. This is what I've become. And as a result of who I am and what I've become, I've got a mission. I've got a purpose out there. And let me tell you about what it is. He didn't sit and say, you know what? I think something's going to happen. So I'll read the scroll and we'll pray for Jesus, for God, the Father, to come and do some stuff out there. No! The Father had already done some stuff in here. It was established in here and he knew who he was. And because of that, he was sitting saying, things are changing. You can come to me now because the anointed one has arrived. If you're looking for freedom, if you're looking for healing, if you're looking for divine intervention, if you're looking for something from the father, come, let's go somewhere. What is God doing in your life? When you become something, you step into a dimension of authority and it comes about and it defines who you are. And when it defines who you are, it determines how you live. The moment you become is the moment authority is confirmed. Uh, authority is confirmed. The moment you become, authority is confirmed.
The moment he stepped into, I am the anointed one. He knew who he was. He had a confidence in who he was. What was he living from? Not his head. He was living from his heart. There was something birthed on the inside of him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge it to your heart and he will direct your paths. You want to do some stuff in your life. You want to see God in your life. You want to see God in your circumstances. Lean not to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. What are you becoming? What? That's the only thing I want you to leave you today with. What are you becoming? And make a, determine, a determination to step into that. Becoming is all about growing into who I am. The moment you were born again, you became a child of God. But it's incumbent on the child to eat. And as the child eats, the child grows. And as the child grows, the child grows into sonship. The, what separates the child from the son is understanding. Understanding in the spiritual dimension is becoming. What are you becoming in the spirit dimension? What are you stepping into? Who are you today? What kind of authority do you wield? Authority is the right to use spiritual power. It means my moral and legal right to exercise power. It's not about me. It's about the government of God. The government of God. And to us, a child is born. And to us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. The government shall be upon his shoulders. As a son, you know how to operate in the government of God. As a son, you know how to exercise authority. You know how to move in power. That's where we're going. That's the whole purpose. Maturity, becoming, becoming. I'm stepping into sonship all the time. It's not limited to Jesus. Have a look at David. Have a look at David. Read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Go and read it. It's from the perspective of who I am. Not will you please provide this for me, Lord. This is who I am. And because of who I am, I live in the expectation that what he's put on the inside of me manifests itself in my world and in my life. He never prayed for protection. Listen to Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the mighty. And I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He'll cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but none shall come near me. Not only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall be for you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. In, my, in their hands they shall bear me up, lest my foot dash and my foot against the stone. You shall tread upon a lion and the, and, and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. I will, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. There's a reason why they called David a man after God's own heart. You know why? Because he knew who he was with God. And when he wrote the Psalms, he didn't write about a God who's out there who might do something for you. And you just keep praying and hoping that something happens. He spoke about what it is to live in relationship with God, to live in a place where who he is begins to reorientate and recalibrate my life so that I walk into who I am as a person defined by who he is.
I live from a different place because that's who I am. I live from authority because that's who I am. I live from the government of God because I recognize the fact that it's taken up residence on the inside of me. And I see myself as an ambassador of the kingdom. I'm here to be able to take the authority and the power of the kingdom and sit and say, change, change. Why? Because you're not part of the kingdom. You're incongruent with heaven to earth. I don't think you were all told the truth when you got born again. I know, it's a shock. I don't think it was intended, but you've probably heard it. And what they said is, I'll tell you what. Do you want to give your life to Christ? Come and get born again. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Yeah, that's not true. I know, now you're really worried, hey. (laughs) Everybody's like, where's he going with this one? It's not true. I'll tell you why. Have a look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let me tell you what happened. In that moment, you got saved. You got born again. When you got born again, because you confessed him, that, you, that God raised him from the dead. What ended up happening is God came in, cleaned you up, made you righteous, and gave you the life of Christ. Come on. He gave you the life of Christ. He didn't take your life. But you see, that wasn't the whole, um, what's the word? What's the, uh, that wasn't the only thing that, that you, you proclaimed. What's the word? How, what is, Confess, that's a good word. Rafa, that's why you're on the front row, man. You're my English teacher. That wasn't the full extent of your confession. The other part to your confession was you confessed him as Lord. You see, that had to do with consecration. At salvation, he gave you his life. But through consecration and him becoming Lord, he takes yours. We hate the word consecration. It sounds so terrible. Any word that has got multi-syllables and it's a religious (laughs) word must be bad. You know it can't be. I've got three of them to give you as well. That's the first one. The point is this. Don't worry about the word. What you need to understand is what it really represents. What it's talking about is this. Through consecration, let me, let me go the other way. Let me give you the other two and it'll lead into consecration. So at re- there, there are two big terms, redemption and sanctification. So what happens is when you got born again, it's the redemption word. This is a good one. Okay. So what happened at redemption was this. It has everything to do with what is spiritual. And so what happened was Jesus came in and the penalty for sin was paid for. Yeah. Spiritually. It was instantaneous. And you became a brand new creation in Christ. He washed away your sins. It was gone. The penalty for sin was paid for. You became brand new. The thing about it is you had a thing here called your mind. And you'd spent X number of years giving definition to what that mind looks like. So the thing about it is now God is at a place where he's saying, okay, let's fix your mind. Your mind is your identity. That's the part of you which is spiritual and determines, it it makes your choices in life. So now what he's saying is, you know what? Here I am, my life is in you, but here's your mind that's been defined by the world. What happened? My head got in my heart. He's saying it doesn't work that way. Remember, you have both elements, but they, they are to maintain exclusive independence from one another. So it's fine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a job of getting your head out of your heart. That's called sanctification. Sanctification is a process. It's not instantaneous. And what happens is that does away with the power of sin. So what it's doing is God sitting saying, fine, you know what? Because I've made you a righteous person. So what we're going to do is we're going to journey through life together. And what we're going to do is as we journey through life, you're going to have hiccups and obstacles. When everything's flying, flying smoothly, we never really encounter God, do we? 
It's when we hit a hiccup or an obstacle where we suddenly go, what else is happening here? I need God. Even people who aren't born again, none of them pray for God to help them with things that they can do. The minute they hit a wall and they can't overcome it, what ends up happening is then it's like, God, please help me. So what ends up happening is as I begin to walk out my life, all these little things are going to pop up now and again. And what's going to happen is it's th those are good. It's not a bad thing because what's happening is life is a filter. And so it's showing you, look what's defining this. So now I've got a choice to make. The thing about it is this. You may have had some addictions. You may be at a place where you feel certain things about yourself, like such as a sense of guilt or, you know, you just really hate who you are. There are all kinds of things that carry power. And the reason that they carry power is because they were defined by who I am, but they were defined outside of God's influence. So they exist. There's little toxic things. And the problem with it is they don't just go. So how do you get them to go? I'm so glad you asked. It's called consecration. Consecration is me sitting saying, I want to partner with you, Holy Spirit. I want to do some stuff with you. This is what it means. Have a look at uh, my notes are getting all, um, what is the word? Yeah, that's the word. I'm not good with words today. John chapter 14, verse 20. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. This is the definition of becoming. Becoming is not, is not only when I know that I am in him, but I know that he is in me. Becoming is not only knowing that I am in him, but I know that he is in me. What are the, each step of the way is referring to, okay, let, let's go back to the life that's on the inside of me. I need this to define who I am. I need that to give definition to who I am. All the time, what I'm doing is I'm filtering out every part of me that I've defined, and I'm sitting saying, I want to replace that with God's nature. Because every time I replace it with God's nature, I introduce who he is into that space. And every time I introduce who he is, I walk into a clearer definition of who he, who he is. It becomes who I am. Galatians 5.25, if we live by the Spirit, therefore walk by the Spirit. What it's saying is, I'm living inside of you. Come to me and get life. He's trying to birth stuff in you. It's not about your head. It's about birthing life because you've become something new. He's wanting to take all of that. Have a look at John chapter 15. I know you're still doubting, so I'll show you another one. John 15 verses 5 and 7. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. You know what he's talking about? Consecration. He's talking about sanctification. What he's saying is, I put the vine on the inside of you. You're the branch. So the thing about it is, are you connected? Are you living from that each step of your journey? Is it giving definition to who you are? Are things changing in your life? Are you always looking for the Holy Spirit to birth something new on the inside of you? That's how we live, connected to who he is. His life is on the inside of you. It's not somewhere foreign. I used to wonder how on earth do I stay connected to the vine? I mean, it was a really good scripture and a good verse, and it's just like you could quote, but it's like, how does it work? He's in you. He put his life on the inside of you. What is his exhortation and his encouragement is live from me. Why? All things are possible if you live from him. Let me tell you this about sanctification. There are different strates of sanctification. There is general sanctification. Things like don't commit adultery. It's kind of like common to everybody. There's personal consecration. God wants to do some stuff in your life. And the thing is, there might be some stuff in your life that are issues for you that are not issues for other people. And there's a consecration for office. Some people are called to specific offices. And because you call to that office, there is a consecration that comes with that. The point that I want to make is this. 
work out your own salvation. What often happens is this. People who live a consecrated life move to a place where they are able to manifest and experience God in ways that everybody begins to notice. So what ends up happening is because you see that, then people start going, okay, well, that's a man of God. Well, how did he get there? And then they go back and they track his path. And he did this and he does that and he doesn't do this and he does do these things. And then what we start saying is, well, this is the formula to stepping into that. There is no formula. Why? Because he works with us individually. He's interested in you. And so the thing is, your path will be different to somebody else's. And so your relationship with God is important because what he does is he works out your own salvation with you. Okay, what does this look like? I don't want you doing this anymore. Put it aside. But he didn't tell Jody that. It's fine. You know, the thing about it is we have to walk our own race. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. Don't model your life after somebody else because it won't get you to the same destination. What they're dealing with in their life is a completely different template to yours. I told this, I told this joke years ago. I, I hope I can remember it. But there was this woman and she was so tight, she refused to pay for a, a personal gym trainer. And so she used to go to the gym. And then there was this, this woman, another woman there, who had her own trainer. And she was like, fine, I'm going to cheat the system. I'm going to listen to everything that the trainer tells her to do. And then I'm just going to do it. So I'll get the benefit. But... I won't have to pay for it. So she did this for three months. And at the end of three months, she walked up to the train and she said, you're useless. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? She said, I've been doing your program for three months. And she said, look at me. My legs are bigger. My this is gone and my that is whatever. And he was like, well, I know. That was the program she wanted. That's what we were trying to do with her, not you. <laughs> This is what happens when we don't model your life over anybody else. It's all about working out my own salvation with God. What is he doing with you? What did he tell you? What did he invite you into? What does he want you to get rid of? What does he want to add to your life? Why? Because I'm in the process of becoming. I'm in the process of becoming. Consecration is not a bad thing. Consecration is not sucking the fun out of your life. Consecration is God sitting saying, I want to get you established in authority and power. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to journey with you and introduce you to it. This is in the way. Get that out. Move this aside. Let, let's move you into the... Now I'm in this place. And when I'm in the place, I live from that. God's not about getting rid of your fun. Consecration all is an invitation to step into authority and power. It's all about becoming who he wants me to become. It's all about renewing my mind so I become and live from who he is on the inside of me. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> this week is about one word. You see, three people were listening to this. <laughs> Three people listen to Sunday. It's about becoming. Becoming. What are you becoming? And at the end of the week, for the brave souls, what did you become? What did you become? This is where our Christianity gets practical. If I can't become, everything else is extraneous. Why? Because I can't apply it to my life. It's not doing anything for me. It'll feed your head and make you, make you dizzy with yourself. It's about becoming. I have to get that, that down. As I move into it, I'm becoming. I'm stepping into my destiny. I'm being conformed to his image. I'm living from a different place. I recognize that anything that's incongruent with the government of, life, of God that reigns and rules and lives in my life needs to shift and change, not just in me, but in my world. Become. Become. Father, I want to thank you for your life inside of us. Oh, I thank you for the fullness of who you are. I thank you that we get to participate and partake of the divine nature. I want to thank you for the invitation that you extend to us to become something more than we could ever possibly be in and of ourselves.
I want to thank you for the life of Christ that just looking for opportunities to come and meet with us and invade our life. I thank you for it, Holy Spirit. I thank you for leading us and for guiding us. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving us understanding, stepping into a new dimension from glory to glory, glory to glory, glory to glory. Let us keep our our eyes and our focus on you. I thank you that you're creating in us people who are established on a foundation of the divine, who are able to walk into our world and introduce the life of Christ. I thank you that in that space, we are the light of the world. Bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.